feels like home, and so that's the, that's the most important thing. And in reading the reading this week, it refers to the reading last week. And for those of you who are here, we're just picking up where Jyotishji and Deviji left off. Uh, these readings are parallel commentaries on the Bible and the Bhagavad Gita. And in this one, Swamiji makes reference to uh, some stories from the life of Jesus, which you would have heard last week. But also there was one earlier incident that I don't think we did cover uh, this particular year. The readings are the same every year, and there's a progression to them. And so that's why sometimes Swamiji will make reference to an earlier story. And so this one is entitled, How Devotees Rise, which is a very special one. Last week it was, How, Why Do Devotees Fall? And everyone kind of, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and even Jyotishji said, you know, and there's more and I'm not going to get into it. We don't want to dwell on that too much, just because it's on one level such a, seems like such a heavy topic, and I'll try to address that a little bit later. But this is how devotees rise, and it refers to the reading last week, where right before Jesus was killed, they basically it was his last meeting with his disciples, which he knew, but they didn't know. And one of his disciples, through intuition perhaps, her, her name was Mary, Mary Magdalene, not to be confused with his mother Mary, 
she um, uh, was basically oiling his feet, covering his feet with ointment. And it was a very expensive ointment. And so it was in a certain way a very lavish thing to do. And this was, of course, also a symbol of her devotion. And in general, the devotee's devotion to the guru. Very easy to understand in India. And the, the land of devotion, I mean. And so uh, one of his other disciples, Judas, who was the disciple who later betrayed him, said to her, uh, he criticized her and in a way criticized Jesus for allowing this to happen. So I won't say more because this will explain it. But Judas was the one who betrayed Jesus. And again, as you would have remembered from last week, it was something that as soon as he did, he regretted. And so it wasn't as if he was committed to evil for the whole rest of his life. It was something that he didn't ever expect would go the way it did. And we can all relate to that on one level, when we do things that cause a big problem and we did not expect for it to be so. So the other <coughs> reference in the life of Jesus that's made here is between the same Mary and her sister Martha. And this was, I think we did talk about this anyway, I had this memory of I was saying how Martha had everyone over at her house with Mary too, and Martha was making all the vada and all the pies and all the idlis. <laughs> and Mary was sitting contentedly at the guru's feet, just absorbing his vibration. And Martha finally said to Jesus, her guru, why can't you ask her to help me? And he said, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled by many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that better part. And so you might expect, he said, yes, obviously she should be serving. And some people uh, even make this, have written books on why actually Martha's way was the right way. But the fact remains that Jesus said, Martha has done the better thing. It wasn't Mary, that she, Mary, Mary has done the better thing. It wasn't that she wasn't <coughs> serving. It's that she was with the guru in her heart, in her consciousness. As Swamiji points out, Jesus may have well then said, Mary, why don't you go and help her, at least bring the coffee or something, <laughs> just for her sake, but do it with an inward connection. Martha could have been serving the guru and all the disciples and had that inward connection and been just as busy and had that inward presence. Mary could have been sitting at Jesus' feet, kind of checking her phone and seeing, you know, read any, any new posts on Facebook or anything, <laughs> and she would not have been doing the right thing. So you see, it's not a question of whether we serve or don't serve. It's the attitude with which we serve. Okay? Thank you very much. I feel like I've given the whole, whole talk already. Now to begin. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Last week we asked the question, why do devotees fall? And we consider the downfall of Judas in this context. Jesus, in answer to Judas's cri criticism for allowing Mary to rub his feet with spikenard, a very costly ointment, said, The poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. I should explain. Jesus said, Why was this oint? Judas said, we have to forgive me with jet lag. If anything I say <laughs> doesn't make sense, just disregard it completely. Judas said, why was this ointment not sold and the money given to the poor? You know, why waste such an expensive thing when it could do more social good? And that's when Jesus said to him, the poor always ye have with you, but me ye have not always. Jesus is saying here that there is one supreme injustice that needs eradication. Poverty, yes, but not of a material kind. Poverty in a spiritual sense. Divine blessings are not common in this world. They are extraordinary. When they come, we should give them priority above every other consideration. Never allow a moment of inner joy, for instance, to be set aside for lesser duties. Divine attunement is our highest priority. As Lahiri Mahashaya, the guru of Yogananda's guru, said, to listen to the heart's inner sound, Om, which issues from the very center of our being, is man's highest duty. Mary, on this occasion, was not communing in inner silence with Christ's spirit, as she had been when Martha urged Jesus to reproach her for not helping out in the kitchen. 
Mary, this time, was serving outwardly, but in a very different spirit from the restless fussing for which Jesus had reprimanded her sister, Martha. Those who see a radical difference between the paths of action and meditation should understand this distinction. To serve in the right spirit is necessary, for only thereby can we overcome our karmic tendencies toward restless activity. The important thing is that that spirit be always inwardly <coughs> focused, that in everything we do, we act in loving service to the Lord. Therefore, the Bhagavad Gita says in the third chapter, the state of freedom from action, that is, of eternal rest in the spirit, cannot be achieved without action. No one, by mere renunciation and outward non-involvement, can attain perfection. Whenever the Spirit of God descends upon you, however, <coughs> remember the words of Jesus, Me have not, me ye have not always with you. Thus through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Oh. Ah, to be back with souls who love God. And that's how we feel in coming back to be here with all of you. There were many souls who love God in Ananda Village too, obviously. And uh, it was very nice to connect with everyone there. And to also bring the uh, story of what's going on here. For some of you who may feel that Ananda Villages in California are far away, um, after finding, watching the movie Finding Happiness, hopefully they feel much closer. But if you haven't seen that movie, or even before you did, it may seem that that's far away, but believe it or not, some people there feel Chennai is far away. Someone was asking me, I met some people from South India, from, from Madras. How far is Madras from Chennai? <laughs> <laughs> the mathematician in me was thinking, zero kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> it helped him to clarify. So the, um, the thing is that uh, they're very excited, everyone, about what's happening in India and with Ananda, with Master's work here. And they're very eager to meet you all, whether they come here or you come there. So keep that in mind. We have a tentative pilgrimage planned in our minds for 2019 when the temple at Ananda Village will be completed and dedicated. It's the 50th anniversary of Ananda village then too, so it's a very sacred time. So, um, the message that when, how, the way devotees rise is by valuing the presence of God, by valuing the divine moment, by making sure that that is what we hold precious above all things, and when that comes to us, that we disregard every other duty, and when we're not so strongly in that state, that we try to bring in that consciousness, whether by uh, japa, whether by chanting in whatever we're doing, whether by taking a moment to glance at some words of masters or something, to try to keep our consciousness uplifted and to make sure that as much as possible we keep the guru with us. And remember how I put that, we keep the guru with us. You could say, well, why doesn't he keep us with him? <laughs> But remember what he said to one disciple when he was telling the monks, never meditate by yourself. And one of them said, but Master, what if I'm alone? And Master said, am I not always with you? And he was saying, I'm always with you. And so he's always with us, are we with him? And again, I don't say that in the thought that no, we're not with him, obviously, and so we should feel so self-critical and no. That's just one other way that Maya tricks us. You see, the ego tries to get us to feel really good about ourselves. And when it fails, because we say, no, I don't want to feel like that. It's just fine. And you should feel badly about yourself. Oh, you're right. <laughs> you were just feeling good about yourself, and you were liking it. Now feel horrible. Oh, I'm so bad. And so just remember, both are, are, are mistakes in, uh, the, in opposite directions, but they're the same degree of mistake. 
Again, I've already given you my disclaimer about jet lag, so I'm going to feel free to say whatever thought comes into my head. <laughs> the absolute value of these mistakes is equal. In other words, <laughs> whether you make a mistake 50 degrees this way or negative 50 degrees this way, it's still 50 degrees off. Centered. And so we want to try to stay centered, and that's how we rise. And so this thought of when the Spirit of God is with you, to take advantage of that, disregarding regarding other duties. There's a number of stories in Masters and Swamiji's life on that. One is that Bernard, who was responsible for, which is one of Master's disciples, was responsible for a huge grand opening of uh, one of Master's temples. I think this was in Encinitas. And the press were coming, and it was a big, huge event. And he was responsible for a big part of it. And the day before the opening, things were not ready, and he wasn't there. And everyone was wondering, where is he? And finally, he showed up the next day, the day of the opening, and Master said, where were you? And Bernard said, sir, I was meditating. And Master said, oh, why didn't you say so? Just like that. There were, he, again, he had that divine presence with him. He took advantage of it, and Master said, why didn't you say so? Now, of course, you can start to think, Did Mas didn't Master know? I mean, didn't he have to, where's Bernard? Oh, he's meditating. But, you know, if Master just did everything internally, he would have no reason to speak. And then we would have no teaching. We would have no stories. And there was a story, and then Master sat there smiling. <laughs> and then this happened, and Master smiled in bliss. There is a teaching in that, that we should feel Master's with us, smiling in bliss, no matter what happens. But it's helpful to have these other stories, too. Swamiji was in meditation, and when he was new to the monastery, he was a monk, just had become a monk. And he felt, he used to, in his... Uh, meditation, uh, ha meditate longer at lunchtime. And so he would go down to where the lunch was served, take a plate for himself, set it aside, and then meditate. And so even if his lunch was cold at the end, he didn't mind because at least it gave him more time for meditating. They had a very busy schedule. There. And so he wanted this extra time for meditation. So one day he said as he was meditating, this feeling of deep joy, of deep divine closeness came upon him. And his thought at that time was, oh, this is so natural. This is so familiar. This is who I really am. And now that I have it, I could never lose it. And so why don't I finish my meditation and go have lunch? And he said that after that day, he lost that consciousness for a time. And it was several months before it came back. And he said, I realized how foolish it was to hold that blessing too lightly, and that from then on he did not make that same mistake. Sometimes you'll find that. You'll be in an uplifted state, and it is worth disregarding lesser duties. That's it, in the reading. It was in quotes. I didn't say the quotes, but they're there. Lesser duties. Remember, as the scriptures say, when a lower dharma conflicts with a higher dharma, then this lower dharma ceases to be a dharma, ceases to be a duty. So our highest dharma above all is to find God. And so that's the only reason why we're here. Like Harry Mahashai said it, the only man's only duty is to listen to the Anahat Bhumi, the sound of Om, which emanates from the heart. Patanjali says the same thing, that you should man's only purpose in life is to listen to Pranava, the sound of Om. And so for those of you who know the Om technique, it would be well to remember that both Patanjali and Lahiri Mahasha are saying, go ahead, listen. And for those of you who don't yet know the Om technique, well, you can learn it. So the other, another story of Master and Swamiji is that uh, Swamiji had really been missing Master. Master had been away. He had several centers, several ashrams to look after. And so he had been away from the headquarters at Mount Washington where the monks and the nuns lived. And Swamiji was with someone outside, and the car drove up, and it was Master after a long, uh, his long absence. And so he invited Swamiji into the car with him. And when Swamiji got into the car, and they had further to drive up the hill of Mount Washington, uh, Master looked at him and said, I have missed you. And Swamiji writes in the New Path, how rare it is 
that someone can catch our innermost feelings so sensitively. And he said they had such a uh, special time together and he was feeling that closeness. And then later he was with some of the other monks and they were just speaking normally about regular things and uh, laughing and he, he allowed himself to get drawn up into that mood. <coughs> and then later when he saw Master, Master said to him, I have missed you. That that inner connection he had pulled away from a little bit now, in telling you these stories, I don't want to give you the wrong impression that Swamiji was forever making mistakes and Master was forever correcting him. Ma Swamiji said to us later, near the end of his life, Master scolded him and corrected him very infrequently. The way it's, he writes it in the new path, it, you would think that it happens a lot. But Swamiji purposely put those stories in there, first of all, for their instructional value, but also to us, but also because he was never in the business of trying to make himself appear more than he was. In fact, you could say he was following in Master's footsteps because in Master's autobiography of a yogi, some people reading the book think, oh, how lucky this little young devotee was to meet all these saints. Master told Swamiji that most of those saints that I went to for guidance ended up asking questions of me. They were wanting me to help them, he said, and it was very frustrating because I was going to them for help. He didn't put that in the book. In fact, he writes in the autobiography of a yogi about everyone except himself. In his autobiography, he doesn't mention anything really of himself at all. And that, in a way, that's very fitting. If he did it, it is fitting. But it also helps us to know what attitudes will help us not to think too much of ourselves. Why do devotees fall? Swamiji said in answer to the question, every time I find myself getting out of tune or starting to drift away from that higher consciousness, it's always for the same reason. He said, it's because I'm thinking too much about myself. And so, yes, if we are never thinking of ourselves at the expense of our health, at the expense of our peace, if we are off balance in that way, then we have to. You're no good to anyone if you're dead. You know, we're, so there's certain limits we should place that, okay, I have to, if I become sick or if I become too much out of balance, I become a burden to those on who I love. So let me not do that. If it happens anyway and you can't help it, fine, that's a different thing. But we do have to kind of keep body and soul together. But beyond that, remember Sri Yukteswar's advice, give the body its due and then leave, leave it because it will uh, serve you if we don't think too much about it and keep on going. And if big karma comes, then big karma comes. And we're paying off lots of karma, so don't worry about it. But that is the thought. How do devotees fall? It starts in the mind, as Jyotishji and Devaji were explaining yesterday. And how do they rise? It starts in the mind. Same thing. Of course, whatever starts in the mind ultimately first starts in the heart. So let us be aware of both, monitoring those. If you're not sure how your heart feels, if you're not sure what your mind is thinking, then just look in the mirror. And if you see this, good sign. And if you see this, it's, it's a warning. As a friend of mine told me once she was having a very hard uh, time in her life, she said uh, it had been very difficult. She said, well, uh, I've been struggling with uh, keeping a positive attitude, and right now she was not in a, having a positive attitude. She said, "I'm halfway to halfway free to God. You have to come over, overcome all your likes and dislikes. I've overcome all my likes. I have only dislikes." <laughs> <laughs> but even in that, she was saying how I see that she was actually choosing the positive. So, if nothing else, find a way to laugh. Master said, read one funny story every day. And he also, Swamiji made the observation that he saw that a lot of troubles in this world come from a lack of sense of humor. <laughs> There's a wonderful shirt, learn to laugh at yourself and you will be endlessly amused. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had that experience coming onto the path myself. I was, I was uh, not very eager to laugh at myself. I might not laugh at my not my, might not mind laughing at myself <laughs> in private, but I was not all that well accustomed to being laughed at in public by others. 
And so I was with Swamiji, and um, we were in a uh, satsang, and he had given the illustration of how, uh, how can Dwaita, which is just vibration, appear the illusion, uh, make, how can it appear? That's not really. How can it make things appear solid? How can it give the appearance, that's the word, of solidity? Because it's just movement. But then he meditated on it. He thought, what about the rotating blades of a fan? When you see a fan on, it looks like a solid disk. And so its motion produces the illusion of something solid. And so he put this illustration in his book, The Hindu Way of Awakening. This was at the time that that book had come out. And I pointed out, helpfully, so I thought, I was new, uh, <laughs> at the satsang, that, sir, if even you can take that thought one step further, that if you uh, threw a rock at that fan, the rock would bounce off, you know, as if it had hit something solid. And he said, that's true, of course. And he said, if you were to sit on it, I think it would give you another impression. <laughs> 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 and everyone in the satsang <laughs> had a similar reaction. <laughs> And I just wanted to hire <laughs> And I wondered, now why did that have to happen like that? And I, I realized that a part of it was that I was saying, I have a way to improve on your idea. I did it so innocently and rather cleverly. I <laughs> and so as the ego had gone up, so it also fell flat. <laughs> So that was the first experience. Um, it was not the last. Uh, there was another satsang where there was a small group of us that were all working together in the same enterprise. And we had just gone through, as a staff, as a group, a very difficult test. Two people from the group had left as a result, not left Ananda, but left the staff. And it was very hard for us because in some way we were all friends. And so everyone was affected by this disharmony. And we were furthermore not just sort of, you know, making chocolates or something, but it was a job where we served many people. And so we had to try to have a positive energy, try to be creative and enthusiastic and so on. And so uh, we were in this satsang with him, which he had partly, I think, because he knew what we were going through. And he said, Does any, what, would you have any questions you'd like to ask? And so, not unlike here, it, there was a silence at first. Everyone was a little shy. And, but then uh, he said, if you have no questions, then um, maybe we can meditate together. And someone said, oh, that would be lovely. And I thought, look, no way. We've got Swamiji here. We have a chance to ask him. We are not going to just meditate during this. I might have thought differently years later. But at the time, I wanted a chance, so I said, Swamiji, I have a question. And he said, how could we expect anything else? <laughs> and so again, everybody laughed. And I, at this time, just you know, turned bright red, but pushed on. But again, I wondered why. And I think now, in retrospect, actually him making any kind of a joke, whoever was the butt of that joke, even if it was myself, it, was, it helped everybody to laugh and to lighten up. But also, I realized he was helping me to see take yourself less seriously. Because it was just the sheer fact of my reaction proved that there was something in there that needed to be healed, needed to be relaxed, needed to lighten up. We can take ourselves very seriously sometimes. And so it's good to remember that God, as Master said, is the nearest of the near and the dearest of the dear. So when anyone else or everyone else misunderstands you, Know that Master never does. Know that God never does. And you say, well, but if I'm fighting with that person, and that person's really upset with me, but of course it's all their fault. It's not my fault at all. <laughs> and God understands me, but does he also understand the other person? And of course he does. He's on everyone's side. But he's on your side too. Remember when Swamiji asked Master, Sir, when you are gone, will you be as close to us as you are now. Will you be as near to us as you are now? And Master said, to those who think me near, I will be near. So let us think him near. Let us know that he's near and have him guide us to freedom. Hello, everyone.
everyone. So nice to see you in person and not just WhatsApp and Skype. <laughs> uh, I remember every time we've come back, people think our accents sound a little strange. So <laughs> apologies for sounding more American than usual. Uh, especially California, they kind of slur their words and sounds really fast. Like that. Um, one thing, one very nice thing about coming back was, I have to say, when we left India, the thought of idli and dosa wasn't really, you know, my top priority or anything. But we came back and had some delicious idli with chutney coming, and we we're like, yum! <laughs> So it's becoming home food, isn't it? Um, I remember when I first learned Patanjali's, uh, um, <laughs> my mind is going blank too, the um, yamas and the niyamas, how much I loved them so much because they gave such guidance in how to be on the spiritual path. I felt a relief having these, I don't want to say rules, but guidelines for how to live and not only that if you haven't taken Raja Yoga yet or if you're not quite remembering it all reread your Raja Yoga book just in terms of how Swamiji and um, Master made the Yamas and the Niyamas so uplifting uh, not rules to cut off our heads but with motivation to to really help us want to uh, follow them and know that our spiritual progress depended on, on that as well. And so often we get questions, especially in level one, you know, how do I know if I've spiritually progressed? Meaning, I've learned Hangsa today, so do I get free tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and so the spiritual progress really depends a lot on our behavior and and to move forward and and especially opening our hearts but I'm talking about behavior right now and how with the yamas and the niyamas Patanjali says that by just taking away the negative behaviors our our nature our spiritual nature automatically flows through and we progress naturally so if we just take away the negative behaviors, our light shines through and we naturally rise. You see? It's, it's what our nature is. So it's really just those bad habits that are keeping us, you know, lagging behind where we want to be. It's not having to do, you know, I did the most, <laughs> Um, Kriyas, or I did the, the, the most service, or I did the most this or that. It's peeling away the onion of the negativities and, and allowing the light to shine through. When I see this room, I just feel it full of so many <coughs> angels. If you are in this room, you want God. We can assume the field is level, a level playing field here. No one is better than anyone else. And there is no competition in this room. The only competition that exists is between ourselves and ourselves with God. That's the only competition that exists. When Swamiji was alive, you would see some people try to vie for his favor. And he would very often not, not pay attention to them at all. And then there would be others who, in their heart, felt such closeness with him. And you would see him responding to that person, even if there weren't any words said between them. But it wasn't Swamiji personally that he was feeling attuned with. He was feeling attunement with that person's love in their heart that they were feeling for God in that. And so we're all connected by that love in our heart to the Master, our love in our heart to, to God. 
And you'll find, you know, when people stop meditating, their vibration gets different. And very often people, when they stop meditating, they'll stop coming here. And we get worried, oh my gosh, this person's not here, and this person's not coming here. Maybe they needed a break. You can't force someone to come back who has decided to just stop for now. And that is really between them and God. It's not for us to try and uh, argue them back into the path or arguing them to behave a certain way or arguing anything. We all do what we do through choice. And so what we can do, though, is always come back to the opening of the heart. You know, being in America, um, there is a, a stronger duality externally because there is so much wealth that is shown. Now, I know it happens, like, especially in Mumbai and Delhi, we would say that all the time, you know, people might buy the most expensive cars and buy the most expensive this or that, and so you can see the disparity between their Mercedes and other people's auto rickshaws or whatever. Um, but in America, it's very much that way. And people are very much looking for that external way to fulfill desires. And with that disparity comes a lot of unhappiness. Now, it's a spiritual unhappiness. Now, that unhappiness exists here, too, in a different way. But you can see it a little bit more clearly um, sometimes in America. And, and the religious tradition um, is very, very diverse. And whereas here, you know, we know 80, 90 percent is one religion, all the religions have the same basis of loving God. So that doesn't matter. But if your outer religion doesn't have you feel devotional, then the majority of people who are not outwardly devotional, it shows. <laughs> and so people who are searching for that happiness outside themselves and not the happiness inside, there's a deep unhappiness that happens inside from that, a deep unhappiness. And it's, it's an example for everyone who is looking in any way outside yourself for happiness when that happiness is inside. And Master said he loved Americans because they had this willpower to get things done and do it. Get it done, do it. And you'll see that. People have that. But when you are saying, I want to get things done, I'm going to do it, there's an implied my way. But what happens when we say, I'm going to get something done and do it my way and not God's way? Then a deep unhappiness happens because we're not following the will of God anymore. We're, we may even be doing good works. I'm going to get that, that you know, temple built. I'm going to get that church built. I'm going to, you know, whatever it is. And yet, we're doing it with our will and then that deep unhappiness is there and to me it just maybe it's for going from one country to another that makes a certain type of thing so obvious but when someone we we taught a level one class and there were some very strong people in the class which always happens in level one you know people are just this is who I am and so so one of the people was just very uh, you know we said, why are you here, and, and those types of things. Well, I'm here because you could tell this person was very competent, and I want the third and the fourth Kriyas, and I'm going to get it. <laughs> you know? But there was also, and I want nothing to do with spiritual organization. <laughs> I, I was thinking, well, <coughs> uh, we do require discipleship before you can get that, but we'll skip that part for now. <laughs> but, so in my mind, I thought, you know what? This is what Master was talking about is, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get it done. I'm going to do it. But then you feel that deep unhappiness in that person not able to say, what does God want? And 
it's kind of tricky anyway. How can we know what God wants? It's so invisible. <laughs> it's invisible. All these things are invisible. But when we listen to, during the presence of God, when we trust that experience of the presence of God that Dharmarajan was talking about, the invisible becomes more visible. It becomes more obvious when we listen inside. And, and when we listen, we can still get confused. We can say, oh God, you know, came to me and said this to me. And then the next day, hmm, I kind of remember what he said, but it, it wasn't that strong. I should have written it down. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't a true message. And so we learn discernment on the spiritual path to know when a message comes to us, if it really came from the guru, from God, versus whether it just came from our egos. And we learn this over time. But we also find that when we follow the thing that came to us, that came from God, our happiness level rises. And we follow the thing that came to us from the ego, our happiness lowers. And we always think, oh, well, God wants me to be small and little and meek and mild and humble and all the, these things. But that's not true either. God wants us to be a bright light in this world. Bright lights make a difference in this world. Bright lights shine and just with their presence and vibration create harmony between others, create, bring harmony into a room, bring harmony and love and peace and well-being to others. And when we just want our own way, we bring disharmony and all the, thing, all the angst that comes about through, I want it my way and yet I'm unhappy. You know, that's an angst. I want it my way, but I'm unhappy. I want it my way, but look, why am I unhappy? If I want it my way and I make it my way, and I'm still unhappy. You know, these are things we think about. So <coughs> the meditation that we do is such a deep blessing from Master. And to open the heart to God and to Master, I think it's one of the biggest blessings we can give ourselves, to open the heart. It's so easy to close our hearts when we want things our way. And again, it doesn't mean our way is not necessarily God's way all the time. But we know when we're unhappy and we have a certain thing we want, but we're unhappy, that was our way. So we want to be happy and have our, our way, but if it's God's way, we'll be happier. So tuning into that. The other way we know, Dharmarajan said, you look in the mirror if it's like, versus, <laughs> look at the people who are looking at you also. When they look at you, are they... Or are they? <laughs> and think, why might they be? <laughs> are we making their life hell? I was very amazed to see in America, a lot of people talked about their families, giving them a hard time. And, you know, we hear it here all the time, too. But we hear it's the same thing in America. Whether we are the brother, the sister, the mother or the father, if we are giving people a reason to look at us like, then we need to think twice about our behavior. Life isn't about waiting for the top dog position so that you can then make other people unhappy <laughs> because they've made you unhappy. <laughs> Finally, I get the role in the family because the eldest died, or the dad died, or whatever. They've all gone, and I'm the oldest now. So, you know, this happens worldwide. Worldwide. <laughs> but think of the karma that we are causing others. I mean, think of the karma we are accumulating by making other people's lives difficult. So, that's an easy thing. Just stop. <laughs> it's easy. Just stop. That's one easy thing to do because, in a way, 
it is a blessing when behavior becomes so um, uh, uh, amplified that it's seen by ourselves and others. That's, that's actually a blessing because somehow things have escalated to a point where you finally see, oh, look what I did. And other people are like, yeah, look what you did. <laughs> One of our friends in America has a problem with yelling at people. And, you know, when it's subtle, it's kind of like, <laughs> when no one's looking. But then the anger gets a little bit more, because Master said the more angry we are, the more it will be in us. And we can say it's that person caused it, that person caused it, that person caused it. But anger is inside. It really isn't dependent on others. So this person finally, his anger got so inside and not healed. And let's put it that way, because when we have that much anger, we need healing. It got so bad that it just became this blurting out thing that happened in front of a bunch of people very embarrassing, right? Because you, you want to look a certain way with people. I am this way, you see me as this way, despite, you know? So it finally came open. Well, luckily he was with devotees who have open hearts and loving hearts. He was able to finally see how ridiculous his behavior was because that's how he was feeling inside that angry. He finally got to see it. He got to see loving faces say, we don't like that. You're going to have to change. And he was like, okay, okay, and he changed. He started working on himself. He started doing things to help heal his anger more. He started to feel better about himself. Because when we let it out on other people, we begin to feel really awful about ourselves. My father was a very violent person uh, verbally, not, not physically, but verbally, and would scream and yell at anybody um, that he could. So as a child, if we even looked at him with fear, it would make him angry because we were reflecting that fear back to him that he felt. And it took a lot of um, years of my own healing to work through what happened during that time. And it's very interesting because for many, many years I have not felt any resentment towards him anymore. It took a long time. But when I did feel resentment at an earlier age, I could tell it affected my heart. It made my heart more closed. And so when I began to heal myself with the help of some others too at times, when I healed myself, then I could open my heart. So when our hearts are closed, we need to look and see why. Is it from past hurts? Is it from, you know, people who over the years did something when we were children? You just never know. Sometimes we're just born with it. Whatever we did in the past life, it's carried over and we have it to deal with in this life. But when the beautiful thing that I've seen at Ananda is when someone really tries to change and puts an effort towards that change, people just accept that person. Again, even though they've caused great hurt, they just accept the person again because it's like, okay, you know, Roger is behaving better. <laughs> Good job, Roger. <laughs> <laughs> and then suddenly, we are all allowed to reinvent ourselves here. This is not a closed circuit family where everybody has a little role to play. And if you're not playing your role, you know, what's wrong with you? Or if you're not being the person you've always been, why not? This is a place where we can grow beyond any roles that we have accepted through whatever circumstances. This is we want to help each other grow spiritually. And in order to grow spiritually, 
we need to not have a cage around ourselves, feeling like we can't break out of the ch cage. We need to feel as though we can open the doors of the cage and fly free. And not just be who, oh yeah, I know you. You know, I know what Rajesh is like already. Good luck, Rajesh, on your spiritual path. <laughs> you know, how many family people might say that? You know, oh, you think you're so spiritual? <laughs> I said, <laughs> why were you so angry last week? <laughs> that doesn't feel good. It's like, oh, they're right. You know, but but it's not nice to say, oh, you think you're so spiritual. It's kind of, it's a real way to kind of punch people down. So, but on the other hand, they did see us really angry last week. <laughs> I think someone someone has something. There's a resonance over in the corner. There's something going on in this corner. <laughs> Let's see also how we can laugh about it. It's so important to have a light heart. It's so important not to take ourselves so seriously as Dharmarajan was saying, and to also just not take life so seriously either. You know, there, there's reasons to laugh. The spiritual path is about joy. And if we're not laughing for no reason every once in a while, we know the joy is gone, and we need to get that joy back. Joy is a wonderful way to open the heart. Just watch a, a movie that's not too in the low chakras, that might be a comedy. <laughs> and allow that joy to, to come up. I think DDLJ is pretty safe, but that's in Hindi. <laughs> they probably have a, a dubbed version of it, right, in Tamil? <laughs> that was one of the first um, uh, Indian movie movies we saw, back when we thought Indian meant Hindi. <laughs> That's what most people think. We're, now we're like, no, there's South India, there's North India, there's East and South, and like, you know, 70 different languages at the least. And so, um, so let's remember to keep the heart light. Let's remember to keep it open. To also forgive ourselves and leave the past behind when we have misbehaved and to just take a new step forward and not keep other people in cages and not allow others to keep us in our old cages and to just be birds that are flying and soaring. Um, Swamiji said once, he said, you know, birds must enjoy it when they're soaring, you know. India has the beautiful um, Indian eagle, which a lot of them are in Chennai. So um, I guess they've said, who cares? I'm not in the mountains or the forests anymore. I'm going to perch on buildings and things like that. <laughs> They're huge. They have a wingspan of close to six feet, um, close to two meters. So they're huge. You don't know it when you're seeing them in the sky. But they really soar. And um, sometimes when we're outside walking, we'll really enjoy looking up and seeing, seeing the eagles soaring in the sky. And it's just a reminder of how we too can soar. And, and let's, let's drop all the past, drop all um, the weights that we have on our feet. And, and when we're meditating, that's a perfect time to just drop everything. Master used to say, dump the body, dump the body. So no matter what is happening in life, no matter what is going on, let's, when we meditate, dump the body. And what happens when we dump the body? We dump the mind, the circumstances, everything we just dump and just go inside and feel the presence of God forgive us for everything and anything we've ever done because we have to get through that our old karma. Sometimes we come to this life with guilt about karma from a, another life. So we, we have to dump all of that. We have to believe that we are children of the light. Believe that that's where we came from. That that's who we are. Children of the light. And that everyone in this room is children of the light. 
And then we expand. Master said, accept the small group with you first, and then expand that out to the whole city, and expand that out to the world. And we can do that. It's, it's beautiful to begin to see everybody as your brothers and sisters. They may not do the reverse, <laughs> but that doesn't matter. We just want to begin to in, be inclusive, <coughs> include the whole world in our heart's tenderness and our heart's love for souls. But we have to see ourselves as a soul also. We have to see ourselves as striving and when we fall, we pick ourselves up. We try to send out that love as much as we can to others in our best way and, and trust that once we've begun meditating, we meditate Kriya Yoga path here. Once we've begun meditating, a lot of it takes care of itself. A lot of the progress, the spiritual progress, just takes care of itself. We'll, we will naturally just drop the bad behaviors and keep moving forward with the positive behaviors. We will naturally rise. We will naturally want to follow Patanjali's yamas and niyamas, naturally. We'll see, we'll naturally say, oh, these things feel good, I want to do it. I love meditating three hours a day. <laughs> you know, I love meditating 20 minutes a day. Whatever it is, love it. Love all the actions that we give to God. And, and try more and more as we open the heart to feel that presence within. That presence, when we listen to it, that is what takes us to God. When we die, we hear Om, and we follow the Om to God, if we're conscious. Otherwise, we're just sucked out of the back and sent over there and go into a little hospital where other little um, advanced, more advanced beings uh, nurse us and try and wake us up from the subconsciousness we had <laughs> and then help us look at the life we lived. That's an unconscious death. The conscious death is when we hear the Om and we feel the body letting go. <coughs> we feel the, the spirit, the soul letting go. And then we go out. And it's a joyous thing, and we know there's just a curtain there. And Master said that when we leave the astral world to come here, there's a funeral in the astral world, <laughs> sad that we've left. And then, of course, when we leave here, there's a funeral here in the physical world, but there's a celebration in the astral. Just like when we're born here, there's a celebration. So just remember, we're going to a celebration. We're living our life now to have a good death. I always like to see who likes squirms in the audience when I say <laughs> Not really. I'm not trying to cause squirming. But, but it's a really good point. Death is not a bad thing. Death is just a step over to the other side. And there's Master waiting for us. There's the Gurus waiting for us whenever that time is. But they're here. Whether we're close to death or not, they're just right here with us. When we left the U.S. and came to Chennai and didn't know anybody besides his cousins, we felt Master and Swamiji so close. And then what happened? They, uh, devotees were in the temple and boom, Master and Swami were there. And then we moved here and boom, Master and Swami are here. Pretty soon we're going to have the Murtis, they already have a presence. Because the de devotion that has just even been given to them through um, all the people who wanted to help make it happen, that in itself is just such a, a beautiful thing.